Hey guys, we're gonna do something a little different today. Um, I haven't been feeling very great. Um, I literally do not feel like I have the energy to set up my camcorder, set up a nice different background, and make myself look nice. Er, <laughs> you guys usually get me pretty natural anyways. Um, so you're getting me on day three of some pretty bad pain right now. Um, it, it's, it comes in waves, so like, it probably won't show my face that I'm in it, because I've kind of got used to not acknowledging it so much. Um, so, I, but I really wanted to get you guys to have the end of chapter two before the end of this week, so I wanted to get that done. Um, and today is December 3rd, so shout out to my not even legally related sister. Amber. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, we only have 10 pages. So 10 pages, I think? 20 pages? Yeah, just 10 pages. So let's just get right into it. And then I'll talk to you guys about some other things. Um, so last we left off, um, Scrooge was in his old school room and his sister had just come to get him and the ghost of Christmas past was ragging on him about his treatment of his nephew. So anyways, <clears throat> although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. <laughs> It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again, but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked Scrooge if he knew it. Know it, said Scrooge. Was I not apprenticed here? They went in. At, th at sight, at the sight. At sight of an old gentleman in a welch wig, sitting behind a tall, uh, such a high, d wow, I am winning right now, okay, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement, why, his old Fezziwig, bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. This part... This particular scene, of course, every time I see the name Fezziwig, I think of Fozziwig. Um, because again, my first real introduction to the whole story was with Muppets Christmas Car Carol, and can't beat that. Um, old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his toes to his organ of benef benevolence and called out in comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, yo -ho there, Ebenezer Dick! Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, it was Dick, poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight, Christmas Eve, Dick, Christmas Eve, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters, one, two, three, had him up in their places, four, five, six, barred him and pinned him, seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hitty ho cried Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hitty ho, Dick, cheer up, Ebenezer. Clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away. They wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away, with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as if it was dismissed from public life evermore. The floor was swept and watered, and the lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. 
In came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned it like 50 stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. Uh, oh. Yes, okay. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. It came the housemaid. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkmaid, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way, who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door, but one who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and everywhere, and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turn, turning up in the wrong place, new cu top couple starting off again as soon as they got there, all top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig clapped his hands to stop the dance and cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter, especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest upon his reappearance, he instantly began again that there were no dances yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home, exhausted on a shutter, and he was a brand new man, resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances, and there were more, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus. Um, I assume this is a food, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was, a, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and the boil and boiled when they when the fiddler, an artful dog, mind. The sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could ever could have told it told it him wow. struck up Sir Roger de Cover de Coverley de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig's top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four and twenty pair pa of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if they had been twice as many, ah, uh, four times, old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. It's not, if that's not high praise, tell me higher, and I'll use it. A positive life appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves, they shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would become of them next. When old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, hold hands with your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck twelve, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas with everybody when everybody had retired, but the two apprentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost, and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, 
to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, and when he was do and when he had done so said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter, self. It isn't that, spirit. It ha he has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or a burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that he, his power lies in words and looks and things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count him up. What then? The happiness he gives it is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think. The ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge, no. I should not like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's that's all. His former self turned to down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick. This was not addressed to Scrooge or to any one whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face was not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eyes, in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root when the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat side by side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has this place to you? he rejoined. A golden one. This is the even this is the even handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty. There is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world so much, she ended gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then, he retorted. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and contented to be so, until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our own patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feelings tell you that you are not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No, never. In what, then? In a change of nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. 
in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly but with steadiness upon him, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Ah, uh, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself, but he said with a struggle, You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows, when I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, you who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you are false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your rep repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you with a full heart for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may the memory of what is past makes me hope you will have pain in this very very brief time and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you wo you awoke may you be happy in the life you have chosen she left him and they parted so again, I'm going to keep making references to Muppet's Christmas Carol. Honestly, I love that. Um, if you have the DVD version, you most likely have the option of the cut and uncut. I recommend the uncut so you can hear this awfully depressing song that this particular character that they gave a little bit more of a character to sings that causes everybody to weep. Um, it's totally worth it. Go for it. <laughs> um... Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, no more. I do not wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room, not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near through the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like the last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count, and unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, there were not forty children conducting themselves like one. But every child was conducting itself like forty. Sounds like a classroom. Uh, the consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them, though I never could have been so rude, no, no. I wouldn't, for the wealth of all the world, have crushed that braided hair and torn it down. For, and for the precious little shoe, I wouldn't have plucked it off. God bless my soul to save my life. As to measuring her waist in sport, as they do, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it, round it in punishment, and never come straight again. And yet I should have dearly liked I am... I own, to have touched her lips, to have questioned her that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair, an inch of which would be keepsake beyond price. In short, I should have liked, I do confess, to have had the lightest license of a child, and yet be man enough to know its value. Charles apparently is attracted to this character. But now a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she was laughing that she with laughing face and plundered dress was borne towards it to the centre of a flushed and boisterous group, 
just in time to greet the father, who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the def defenseless porter, the scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets to spoil him of brown paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round the neck, pommel his back, and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was, re was received, the terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into his mouth, and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm, the joy and gratitude and ecstasy, they are all indescribable alike. It is enough that, by degrees, the children and their emotions got out of the parlor and, by one stair at a time, go up to the top of the house, where they went to bed and subsided. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever, when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and being a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. Bell, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Tut, don't I know? She added in the same breath, laughing as he laughed, Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. He pa I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear, and there he sat alone, quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you. These were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, said Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which in some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me, take me back, haunt me no longer. In the struggle, if that can be called the struggle, in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its own part, was undisturbed by any effort with it, of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap, and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and, further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. And that's the end of chapter two. Um, so that was Christmas past. So I was thinking for a while what I wanted to do for a little talking piece. Um, so hopefully you guys would comment some with your own things about basically what were some family food traditions that you may or may not have had or things that you would like to do during the holidays with your family or siblings or friends even because friends are the family you choose. Um, so in my family for the longest time, um, what would happen is at 3 a.m. I would get up, not that I actually slept until 3 a.m. I literally was just up until 3 a.m. waiting, um, <laughs> go downstairs and get all the stockings for my siblings. And I would actively chuck them at my siblings' faces or stomachs while they slept. Um, and then sometime around 4 or 5, after we all kind of like opened our stockings in our own rooms, they, for some reason it was always my room, probably because I was the one chucking them at them. Um, my siblings would come up and we would compare, uh, the colored toothbrushes and toothpastes and batteries. Um, I usually had earrings cause you know, I have pierced ears. Um, 
deodorants. It was it was almost always practical stuff, but there was also candy in there sometimes, um, based on what my what my what could be fit in them. And that was always such a blast for me. It was just like having them there, you know, our own little mini sibling Christmas opening. And then um, after the first year, so when my parents married each other they this is their both of their remarriage um so we, we were a mixed family um after their marriage my parents actively told us that if the, if we began singing before like eight o'clock in the morning to get them up like they would they would not let us open presents basically the rest of the day because it used to be at like six o'clock in the morning I would once more gather my siblings and we would sit in front of my parents' door and most of us have the ability to carry a general tune, um, but that was not how we sang. We would sing Christmas songs in the most obnoxious ways possible, but usually like Rudolph and, and you know, um, Jingle Bells, Frosty the Snow, like really simple songs, because you know there's a there's a huge age gap between um um me and my first my my brothers, my biological brothers, and um my my I I, I don't want to call them step siblings because they're you know they they are my siblings um legally we're siblings so just siblings my youngest siblings who are not related to me my blood in any way um. Because, you know, there was quite an age gap between us, so, like, we had to keep some of the songs pretty low-key for them until they learned more in their future life. Um, I think there was a couple of years where my older brother would try to make coffee, and we messed up a couple of times. We just caught the grounds in the coffee. Don't really know how we did that. We, we didn't know what we were doing. Just... Here you go, Mom and Dad. Merry Christmas. We Now can we open a present? <laughs> it's 8 o'clock. Um... It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. We had some good memories. Um, we There's more things that I could tell you um, as well. Uh, for example, food and stuff like that. But I'm going to save that for a little bit later date. Um, I just want to talk about like active traditions, about like present opening and stuff like that. Um, or in the case of your friends, like how do you how do you how do you go about delivering your your presents to your friends? Do you exchange friends or cards with uh, presents with friends or just cards or um, do caroling stuff like that? Um, let me know. I'm really interested in all of you guys' like personal family, like first thing in the morning holiday things and if you don't celebrate Christmas obviously tell me more about whatever holiday that you do celebrate and what activities that you do um, that are really special to you so I'm gonna leave this because this is almost 30 minutes wow um, I'm feeling a little bit more positive I still have pain but you can't can't tell because my moods increased thanks for joining me guys bye